There's a bunch of fascinating directions in nuclear. There are concerns that need to keep being addressed that are not, the story has not been written on those concerns. They certainly haven't been written on nuclear war, but we know enough that I feel comfortable in my own life answering for my loved ones and the people I, I care about. I feel good working in nuclear and finding ways to do more nuclear energy and trusting that we will use that energy cleanly and well. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Mark Nelson. Mark is a nuclear engineer and a nuclear energy consultant working to facilitate the energy transition. He joined me today to discuss the benefits of nuclear and the concerns that people have. Understandable fears that were embedded in society in the 60s during the nuclear crisis but which are unfounded given the technology we have available to us today. This is a very, very wide-ranging conversation. Mark is the first nuclear person that I've had on the show, and I do try to ask him everything. So we do jump about quite a bit. And obviously, given a topic this dense, nothing was covered in depth. We could have spent hours on each of the topics that we had to blast through, which included the size and safety of uranium mines compared to coal plants, the comparison of energy from coal and nuclear plants, how to transition decommissioned coal plants into nuclear plants, and why that's a political win for people on both sides of the aisle. The fears that people have around nuclear waste, with Mark also explaining how nuclear waste can be recycled with some of these new reactors that are now being built. This is what he calls the closed loop energy, this future efficient energy, whereby we could power the world, he says, with an unlimited amount of fuel that is clean, that is safe, until the sun explodes. <laughs> As I say during the episode, I have heard from a couple of engineers that nuclear is truly an excellent option. And France, having bet on it decades ago, is one of the only Western European countries that experienced energy resilience through the energy crisis that was triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There are many questions surrounding nuclear. However, it's not a value-neutral technology. The fact that it was developed alongside the most dangerous technology the world has ever produced. The fact that even though we can apparently manage it, it does produce dangerous waste. And the fact that nuclear demands long-term planning. And when I say long-term, I mean for hundreds of years, not just for a couple, which politics seem incapable of doing at this time. And we do have a long discussion about that. The reality of our political situation today, the reality of increasing political and societal instability, and what that means for nuclear projects. This, I hope, will be the first of many episodes on nuclear because I understand that it is widely misunderstood and underreported. And so strap in for the first whirlwind tour of everything nuclear on Planet Critical. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Mike, thank you very much for making the time to be on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Rachel. My first question for you is why is the world in crisis? In my opinion, and looking from an energy perspective, because that's what I do. I think we're in crisis because we can't build the right infrastructure to provide a large amount of clean energy that does not impact or damage the natural environment. So in my opinion, we need to learn how to build the right energy infrastructure and then everything else, if it's still a crisis, it may just be either human nature or above my pay grade. <laughs> okay, define clean energy infrastructure. Sure. So in my opinion, um, the correct clean energy sources take up very little space. 
leaving as much as possible for humans and wildlife. And in my opinion, they should not put out carbon dioxide or other uh, industrial gases as part of their operations. I think that uh, although certainly there are many people in the engineering and energy community that don't see a problem with it or do see a problem but doesn't think it can be helped or sees a problem, thinks it might be able to be helped but at too great a cost, well, I think that we can help and we I think it does matter. And I think that carbon dioxide is an experiment we're having with the atmosphere that's that's uh, not worth the cost when we have alternatives. Mm, that's nice. So these list, this list of alternatives, I assume that would include solar, uh, wind. What about nuclear? So I am a nuclear engineer by training, but it was the last stage of my education. Mm. I was more interested in wind power before that as an aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineering overlaps with wind turbines. Wind turbines, the blades themselves, they're just big airfoils. But uh, something was nagging me about it. I don't know if this is a uh, toxic engineering masculinity or whatever, but <laughs> something just didn't get me that excited about wind turbines. Maybe now they're so big that uh, they're so massive that they're almost like building a space shuttle or a moon base. But uh, at the time, at least, I didn't see how wind power was going to get the job done. And although at the time I didn't, I just wasn't very much a nature person. I didn't really care about putting a bunch of wind turbines in the environment. That didn't bother me at all. Um, now, I see things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that the extreme compactness of nuclear energy is an astonishing feature of it. By that, I mean, you can have a few acres site um, near, near a city, as scary as that sounds when I first say it, and you can have a few hundred unionized workers uh, uh, go by day or by night to their factory, eight hour shifts, 10 hour shifts, and from that, you can power a city of 10, you know, five, 10 million people if you have a few of these sites. And then I, you know, I, I went to the uranium mines and I saw that if we get uranium mines right, it's, it's possible to do almost everything right and wrong. If you get the uranium mines right for the uranium fuel for nuclear reactors, it's one of the most astonishingly clean, low impact industrial sites that I think we can have as a humanity. I've been to a mine where the surface of the mine, surrounded by nature uh, for hundreds of miles, really, and the surface of the mine, you can walk across the buildings in about five minutes stroll. But underneath, there's a little bubble of uranium that they're, they're getting out bit by bit, and it's powering about 30 million people, carbon free. Uh, that is, I, I know it sounded like I just said, oh, it's mining. People think mining or mining's bad. I get it. There are some astonishingly horrible looking mines out there and damaging mines. And the history of mining is just one of astonishing darkness. But the fact that you can get a mine right and get 30 million people carbon free powered off that. Now, if you say, well, what about conservation? Great. Now we can power 50 million people off the same mine. That's amazing. People are like, well, what if we what if we don't use so much energy? That's amazing too. Now, people in other countries, you could power 50 million Africans off of that instead of off uh, burning trash or burning the last bit of local forest or burning uh, imported charcoal from somebody else's last bit of forest. So it, I, don't, I don't really accept that substitution argument. If you find a mine as tiny and as clean as the uranium mines that we have, like in Canada, for example, powering cities in, say, America, where, um, again, every argument for conservation just means that instead of 2 million people being powered by a reactor, now it's 4 million. Um, and then some people want to go the other way. They say, we need to use way more energy. Well, fine. Well, fine. Just um, have barely no impact on Earth. And no, I understand. But look, Rachel, you're in a world where a lot of people are going to argue we should use more energy. And a lot of those people have a ton of energy to put behind their efforts, right? Mm -hmm. So if your argument is we should save energy, I'm here for it. Now, there's a lot of places that haven't really gotten to what you might call minimum survival levels. Not sure. And either they have to leave, either that's because there's war disrupting it or something. Arguably, a lot of places need to use a little more. Absolutely. Um, but even, even the richest places in the world conserving means that there's more of this tiny impact clean energy for others. Now, in there, I'm sure I hit on a lot of 
hot we need topics. To, we need to parse some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah let's yeah, parse. Yeah. We need let's to, parse. yeah, because I think the, the conservation, it's not quite clear. Um, but first of all, you, you've said a couple of times, getting a mind right. What does that actually mean? Uh, to me, mm. let me let me describe the, the one uranium mine I've been lucky to sure. look, go see. Um, I'm trying to convince the company to have a lot more mine tours. They're a, one of my, I'll just say people want to know what I do for work. I'm a consulting, mostly not engineering, although I want to do more consulting engineering in the, in the future. That's my, that's my education and my family background. At the moment, though, a lot of what I do is visit nuclear plants, towns near nuclear plants, cities near nuclear plants, mostly in places that are trying to shut down their nuclear plants to try to understand who's pushing back and why. What do they make the argument needs to be done? And do they do they have the the people and the I don't know the local support in order to make a bigger push to save their own nuclear plant? In the process of trying to work on saving nuclear plants around the world, I ended up having a pretty good idea of what why people do or don't like nuclear. That ended up meaning I could write more carefully or more uh, valuably. Let's put it that way on whether people wanted or didn't want nuclear in the future and what the conditions were in the power grid or the policy space in order to cut off nuclear if that was what was happening or build more nuclear if that was what was happening. So I ended up being a, call it a well-connected consultant who was able to see the situation for nuclear in many countries. And there are companies who are interested in that, some because they don't like nuclear and trying to figure out whether that's the right stance, others because they work in nuclear, and if people turn against nuclear, that's the end. So that's how I make my money as a consultant. I used to be in an NGO. That NGO uh, was just trying to save nuclear plants. So my consultancy work came out of that. So part of this, though, I was able to get a very rare thing, a trip up to this uranium mine. You asked me, what makes a good mine? Here are the attributes of this uranium mine that make it unlike any, any other industrial site I've seen that's dug into the dirt. First is this, an intense preoccupation with the site boundary and making sure that environmental impacts did not extend beyond it. Most mining takes an enormous amount of water, spray down rock, keep dust down to, uh, carry, it, to carry out a mine waste. There's all these things you use water for. Because the uranium mine makes so much uranium with so little rock, like it's almost pure uranium ore. It's like a 17% average ore when most mines around the world have 0.1%, 0.05%, or it's just, you know, a thousand to 10,000 times more rock moving than the stuff you're trying to chase. It, well, it's not like that at the uranium mine. So they barely use any water, which means their water quality controls are extravagant. They batch test water before it leaves the mine. What that means is they don't, they don't have the water flowing out into nature and they say, okay, we're sampling as it flows. Good, good good. Oh, bad. Shut, shut off the float. Turn the pipes. At that point, some would already be flowing out to, the, to nature, right? In this mine, they batch test, meaning each, each mine uh, quantity of water, like maybe a day or two, is there. And they check it. And they make sure it's, it's pure. It's not going to hurt the environment. And then they release it. That's almost not possible with other types of mines. Another one, but is other the, types of mines aren't, you know, digging out radioactive materials, as well, right? Yeah, they are. Wait, are they? wait, wait, wait. You're kidding, right? Well, I mean, like copper's not. What? Nickel's not. No, 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 no. But there's only a little bit of the copper and nickel. Of right. course, there's radioactive. The rock's radioactive, Rachel. Almost every mine is radioactive. <laughs> what? Yes. How? Because that's the what the rock is like. Okay, well, this is, this is kind of exciting. Yeah, almost every mine has radioactive waste. Like one of the funny things is that a mine where only a tiny bit of what they're going for has anything to do with radiation, but the entire thing gets counted as radioactive waste unless there's like a commercial use for the, say, the thorium that comes out of the mine. Yeah, so, okay, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. Yeah. We're in a radioactive universe, right? Now, you might be saying, oh, is Mark trying to trick me? Everyone knows that uranium's more radioactive. Only a, like there's a there's uranium and uranium's daughter products and thorium mixed into almost all rock. Um, the, the uranium mine is just highly concentrated uranium, which means highly concentrated mining, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're if you're getting and also here's the other thing at the levels of radioactivity of like raw uranium in most mines or most rocks like you know, copper mines or nickel mines, a lot of your concern is a little bit more that chemo toxicity rather than the radio toxicity. That is the the harm to living things from the chemical interactions of copper or other he- other metals or heavy metals that are in the rock. Even the metals that are heavy metals that are radioactive at the levels of radiation we're talking about, especially in natural natural mines that haven't undergone like a nuclear reactor or something that it's it's a different thing than after it comes out of a nuclear reactor. I should just say you've got the before and the after on the before levels. You're definitely looking at one. Almost everything's radioactive and there's going to be radioactive that you can easily detect uh, at, at non non nuclear mines. And then two. You've got the heavy metals that are the bigger issue, even at the radioactive, highly radioactive mines, if that makes sense. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, one of the major pushes in the mining world for the interest in thorium fueled reactors, which is not something I I really work on much, though we can talk about it if you've heard that buzzword, um, is because if you make a use for the thorium, then the otherwise what's considered radioactive waste is a byproduct of mining other things like rare earths. Uh, for electronics and or for, um, you know, various semiconductors and magnets and other things that are part of all clean energy technologies. Well, you'll be able to classify the thorium as a future commercial product, not as a waste product, uh, because it's it's radioactive. But what is, and so, what is the classification? Oh, it do? means that instead of having an immense quantity of radioactive waste, you have a future commercial product and it's regulated differently because you're not allowed to hold for uh, future use stuff that's waste. You have to do something that secures it for a long period of time to the standards of the mining environmental laws. But if it, if you have a bunch of thorium uh, filled rock and you're saying, no, this is our future thorium product line, then it you can you can manage it in a way that's more like each period of time you confirm that you're you're storing it safely for use in the near future, as opposed to storing it for ever or disposed of it forever or backfilled forever and guarded against water intrusion forever or whatever. Mm. I mean, that sounds like a bit of a double-edged sword, to be honest, because people could say that, well, now that they no longer have to store it forever, they could be even more lax with how they, what they do with it. I hear you. So then the question is, are we going to do mining? You might say, then that's why not to do mining at all. I get it. We could go into that. But if there is going to be mining, especially for getting off fossil fuels, say, um, if we're triaging, if we must, Mm -hmm. you might say we don't. But if we must triage and we're doing mining to build the equipment that runs without fossil fuels, then in that case, um, you have to decide, is it worth it? And Mm -hmm. a lot of these questions are very serious, difficult trade-offs. There are people in mining and mining regulation that are like the environmental hawk side. And there are people in mining and mining regulation that are like, the way to be an environmental hawk is to get this mine built so that the products that don't use fossil fuels cost less. Mm. I, mm. in nuclear, we barely need to mine. So I can be a bit of a holier than thou, obnoxious purist about it. <laughs> I mean, if you tried to run mines the way we run our uranium mines, kind of shut everything down. What is that? Well, okay, what does that mean? I think... I think ultra okay. pure water, ultra small land impact, ultra small human impact, um, very, okay. very well paid workers, well trained workers, an intense amount of regulatory oversight, um, ultra pristine environmental surroundings. Um, yeah, it's the, the size matters in the end, Rachel, size matters in mining and the mines for the, the like the, the one I went to for nuclear, they're just. Do you have a like that. comparison? Okay, like the yes. Size yeah, wise? I, I do. What's, okay, what so size if I are we talking compare, about? If I want to compare to things that I've seen and been myself, let's compare to two different things. One, I know you're saying I don't like coal either, but a coal mine. I'm actually in not Germany, saying these things that you're saying are coming from my mouth yet. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me put it this way. Some people think that it's better to mine coal than uranium. Some people think that we shouldn't mine anything in the whole world. Both of those have have uh, fairly important implications. Mm-hmm. Then I'll say this, Rachel. Apologies for putting words in your mouth Thanks. that you didn't have. I'm going to compare to two things. One, 
just a, a, a coal mine that I've been to in Germany that's open and operating and produces a little bit less energy at the moment, but they could scale up production and it used to produce more in the past. So the size is, it's pretty close from like a numbers size uh, in terms of how much energy is coming out and for what purpose, baseload electricity generation. And then the other side, I'm going to compare to just like um, something we know the we know the scale of and can compare to. So uh, I don't know what continent most of your listeners are, are in, but in an American sense, like an American uh, middle-sized city park, um, let's say Central Park is about um, two and a half times bigger than the mine site of this uranium mine, including the outbuildings, uh, housing for the workers, the um, God, the various huge. pits and facilities needed. So that's, mm -hmm. that's I mean, if you're a new runner, that seems like, and you're going to running in Central Park, that seems large. But mm -hmm. in terms of industrial facilities, they don't typically fit that way into, into cities, especially not mines. Whereas if we talk the coal mine that's producing about the same kind of output, I want to say... I need to check this because now I've used Manhattan and Central Park. It's going to be uh, bigger than Manhattan. Um, and oh, it's just wow. this massive pit in the ground, almost as far as the eye can see. Like you can barely see the end of it. And it's about um, 30, 30 meters deep, 40 and meters deep. How much, how, how many homes is that powering? Um, so when they're using the coal plants in a weird way in Germany at the moment, but imagining... Uh, when it was new and, and going well, if that's powering about um, one of these big mines in eastern or western central Germany, it's going to be powering about so 30 to 40 terawatt hours of energy per year, which is going to be um, like uh, four or five large nuclear reactors. And that is going to make about, um, sorry, doing some math here. About a million people in a rich country at about 10 terawatt hours. So call it uh, three, four million, which means I've, I'm unfortunately I've gotten my numbers off by a factor of 10. The, the energy coming out of the uranium mine is about an order of magnitude above that. The coal mine is going to be about three, four million people. The uranium mine is about 30, 40 million people. Three, four million people. Okay, so that massive coal plant would be powering the energy for a, three to four million people for a year. Well, that's the it obviously that, that whole the size of Manhattan needs to get bigger if they're if they're they're scooping it Just, out, right? But uh, it's yeah, gonna but, be feeding power plants that each year are putting out about that much power. Okay, okay. And a uranium and the uranium mine that's two and a half times smaller than um Central than Park. Central Park. But well, I uh, again What's... I'm I'm doing some really, really, really quick estimations. Yeah. I'm gonna be pretty close. But we'll want to check, and we can get the numbers just right after this. Give me a ballpark. That's fine. Sure, it'll be it'll be a fraction of the size of Central Park. No, 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 no. How many how many people is that? I need oh, the equivalent in uh, terms of so what's that I, the, powering. The only uranium mine I've I've been able to visit like this because it's again it's really hard to get tours, as you might imagine, mm -hmm. is Cigar Lake Mine. Not an amazing name, but that's the name of the lake. So Cigar Lake Mine is about tens of millions of people constantly. Okay. And then if you How want to start getting into the, the solar and the wind comparison, it's not How many it's tens not of millions? It's 20 or so. 20. Okay. Yeah. So a typical coal mine would be huge, essentially, is what I'm hearing, um, and would power a fraction of what a smaller uranium mine can do. That's it, exactly. The and here. the uranium mine from like tail to tip, uh, as in when the uranium comes out of the earth, to when it turns into waste at the nuclear plant. It's just it's just small, heavy, compact, and, and shielded. The whole point of the getting the coal out is to burn it and just to release that mm. to nature. Mm. And then the coal ash itself is, of course, ironically, radioactive. And uh, it's, <laughs> but that's the, the radiation in the coal ash is the least of your problems. Okay. So, I mean, I've heard that... Maybe we should maybe we should walk it back a uh, step and also sure. talk about why people are afraid of nuclear and the links between nuclear energy, nuclear waste, nuclear technology, nuclear bombs. 
um, and kind of what went wrong with the the understanding of the possibility of this energy because I mean from what I understand is you can have I remember an engineer showing me once you could have kind of this like compact you know like parcel sized you know bit of uranium and that would power somebody for their entire lives essentially yes um so it's an insane Which, by the way, energy source that is exactly what makes the uranium mine so small compared to the number of people it powers mm, yeah. you need you need tr several train cars of coal um to do the same things like entire hopper cars yeah. filled with coal to get yeah. the same stuff no it's incredibly energy dense the most energy dense thing right that we have right now but what went wrong? Why don't people like it? Why are people scared of it? So I'm doing a lot of research on this right now because I'm writing a book on it right now. And it and I, you know what, I'll tell you, for a lot of us young people, it's almost impossible to put ourselves in the mindset of the first young generation, call it the baby boomers, to be born into a world where their parents feared, say, maybe disease, but that was going away. Maybe some famine, but in the rich world, that was kind of going away already in 1900, 1910. For the first time, baby boomers had what appeared like prosperity forever at the exact same time when we were developing the nuclear weapons and the nuclear missiles that all other weapons had been used in war, right? Mm -hmm. All other weapons, including nuclear bombs themselves, had been used in war. And suddenly you could see the lists of missiles and warheads. And you could put two and two together and realize you could never sleep safe again. Your family was never safe again. Nature appeared to never be safe ever again from your perspective as a human. If you're not there to observe it, it scarcely matters if it recovers, right? And it looked like for, you were the first generation where Old Testament style, biblical, godlike, wiping out and salting the earth. Hmm was possible using the same evolution of technologies that had always been used in the past whenever war hits. And I think it really, really messed with people. But hold and on. You had the rise of the environmental movement that saw, yeah. okay, this nuclear can kill us all. And we're spreading across the earth rapidly. We're going to eat it up like insects, right? And this nuclear can both kill us all and apparently people are saying that the nuclear can help spread across the earth. And both of those things led to a powerful hate and fear of nuclear technologies of almost any kind. What, what do you mean spread across the earth? Well, have you read the writings of the early like 1950s, 60s, 70s uh, environmentalists? Um, which ones? Um, let's say the type of people that ended up helping write for the Club of Rome. Um, I mean, the most famous name that everyone says Danella when Meadows. they're talking about this sort of bitter and negative approach to humans, mm -hmm. Paul Ehrlich, who's still alive and still apparently writing editorials. He was a Stanford professor that was very famous for writing the book, uh, The Population Bomb. Had oh, a okay. cover on it with yeah, a yeah, bunch yeah, of yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. young, yeah. largely brown people on it saying, oh, they are spreading, they're breeding like vermin and they're going to eat the earth. This is something that environmentalists from my generation, if, you, if we haven't seen it, it's scarcely possible to see the words that the previous generation of environmentalists used to describe people, humans, people in the global south. It is revolting. It is disgusting. It is anti-human, to be quite frank. Not enough to make you scream and cry and go join the uh, you know, fossil fuel world, but it's pretty shocking what they thought of people. And I think that that attitude, not all of it was because they were worried we wouldn't have enough resources. I think a lot of them literally didn't want those people to exist, regardless of if there were enough planets to take care of them. And then you could cover this up with like saying, well, I'm fighting for the gorillas and we need a 90% population reduction. That's what Jane Goodall still says. We need a 90% population reduction. Okay. Uh, how are we going to, as a young person... Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's so much going on here. Hang on. Well, I, need to, I, I understand. I I'm just saying. I need I'm just to saying, stop you. I need to stop you. This is the type of I'm worried that you're going to say something thing. slanderous on air. No, 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 no. No, they're proud. They're proud. They're, <laughs> Rachel, 
The older generation is proud. They say we told we warned you about people. Now there's a seven no, billion. No, I mean, my, I've I've interviewed a lot of people on the population problem. Like this is not something that I, I know nothing about. I just um um careful. It <laughs> can make you hate an energy slanders. source that we right. don't run out of. That's my point. It can make right. you hate something if we don't run out of it and if it appears to be connected to nuclear war and nuclear bombs. Okay. I I see that. That is an interesting argument. Um I think that it I feel like it, it's missing a, a a part given like we still have nuclear warheads and we still uh -huh. have nuclear missiles, but the thing that we don't have is nuclear energy. So, so the second part of what I would say is mm -hmm. I've noticed in my generation, so I'm I'm 34, and people my age, a little bit older, and all the way down to Zoomers, um, who are now starting to seriously think about environmental issues, energy, uh, power production, war. What I don't find is fear of nuclear war that much, or people might be afraid of nuclear war, and they're like, yeah, the thing that I'm really worried about is AI, because what if they launch a nuclear war? It's not, I'm so scared of nuclear war. How might that happen? Well, AI is one thing, uh, you know, terror. Like, in other words, nuclear war is not the ultimate of all fears. It's mixed in as one of many things we're afraid of, including climate crisis, right? Yeah, that, but, but, but that is the because we have older than us. But that's but that's because this is a particular moment in history where, like, the confluence of consumption and neoliberalism and everything has formed this like very complex meta crisis. But that's not the way it looked like before. People sure. were like, we have to have this ideology or that ideology so it'll save us from nuclear war. Like nuclear war was the great central thing that could kill everybody and you had to stop it. Right. Mm. But for us, we're like, yeah, there's a this is a big moment. This is as opposed to all the other moments where 34 year olds wrote about how this is the key moment. This is our 34 year old moment because that's my age. Now, I'm not trying to say there isn't a special moment, but each generation is pretty damn sure that the special moment is their prime. Um, and, and that this, uh, look, if you want to see why each generation was right and wrong, you can see it in the past. You can't see it for us yet. It, the future isn't written and there might be nuclear war. So sure. like, I'm just saying on the nuclear war fears, the decline in nuclear war fears were not apparently justified really by no. a decline in nuclear weapons. Sure. If you had if you had governments threatening to use or deploy nuclear weapons the way we've heard in the last few years, it, in the 60s, in the 70s, it would have been a global it would have been a global emergency. Right. But now we're like, oh, that's as, that's the that's the level of threat, like a tweet or a blog post. We're very right. tired. <laughs> exactly. No, the nuclear bombs are still there, Rachel. I know. They're still there. So the threat's still there. Well, exactly. My point is the fear has declined. But I would but this is but I would say, okay, so I think you could say has the fear declined or has like shifting baseline syndrome kind of made it that it's, you know, a nuclear yes. world is like a normal world. But it's, it's expected for people to have nuclear weapons. Now, like that's the world that we were born into, and that's perhaps yes. that could explain. And also this sort of like lull of um um, well, nobody's used them in a while, so maybe it'll be okay. You know, that kind of thinking that... Oh, I've seen more extreme than that. I I'm see people sure. our age and younger convinced they're a plot. They're a, uh, they're a conspiracy. There's no such Great. thing as nuclear cool. weapons. Wonderful. That the powerful countries pretend there is to stop us from having nuclear energy. I see that and oh, I'm like... Oh, that's what? a fun conspiracy. Oh, I've been, every time I see that, I save a tweet. Like I'm like, hmm. okay, another example for my book. That another is example fun. for my book. But listen, um, I think the the thing is, like, surely there was also, you know, a huge push from the fossil fuel industry, because if nuclear is as good as nuclear energy engineers tell me, um, then it would completely change the energy game. It would be a, a source of like not unlimited, and there's different numbers on that that we should get into, but sure. very very cheap, um, greenhouse gas free energy that with the right and this is i know pretty nuts to say and really problematic but with the right international treaties and the way to like manage the nuclear waste um could essentially just give everybody access to cheap almost unlimited energy so it would seem to me that it was the fossil fuel industry that came in and probably you know tried to shut that conversation down in the in the 50s and the 60s so now we have a generation gap that's quite interesting um in the earliest stages of the nuclear 
call it adventure, the nuclear nightmare, whatever it was in the 40s and 50s. Fossil fuel country companies were all over that. They thought it'd be something that they had like a product line, their fossil fuel line, their nuclear line. They saw, a lot of them saw it as inevitable. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Different companies involved in, in chemicals or fossil fuels played roles in making it not inevitable. Um, I'm always looking, there are people in the nuclear movement call it the, the movement of people who say we ought to have more nuclear why don't we i'm going to go into the archives and check why so in that group we have people who are absolutely convinced they have smoking doc yeah the smoking bullet the guns mm -hmm. not the bullets the smoking guns they have the bullets that were the anti-nuclear efforts of fossil fuel i think it's somewhere probably between that and taking advantage of the weakness or the difficulty of nuclear energy mm -hmm. i will tell you that as i am contacted by young people around the world who find nuclear on the internet find my twitter and then are like hi mark i want to i want to get nuclear energy in my country what do i have to do and i and i i reach out and we say okay what's the situation i find young people who are like working as chief of staff in the office of the ceo of the national oil company and they're like I can't really mention nuclear. Hmm. So it's it's both a thing that if you it, you can over egg the pudding on this argument, and some people do. I think it's absolutely inescapable that nuclear. in many different times and places, including today, fossil fuel industry is as like a as a financial and leadership level thing does not like the threat of nuclear energy working now. You there today, there's perhaps a little bit more hubris, people who don't think they even need to try to stop this resurgence and discussion about nuclear because they think it's it'll never be good enough. They don't have to stop it. There's also another thing happening, which is, let's say, 50, 55 year olds and younger in in the oil and gas industry. Almost every time I run across any number of them. They say, well, I've all I personally have always liked nuclear. I don't know why we're not doing it, but oh, well, time to dig a well. You know, mm -hmm. so like that's the that's the attitude I'm hearing. And for the younger people, like 35 and under, I'm hearing stuff like, oh, I would totally switch to nuclear tomorrow. Where's the jobs? Mm -hmm. um, and then for people out in the countryside who are I just live with oil and gas. And there's this is very different in America than in many countries, I believe, because in America, a lot of the rural economy, people like own their own wells. They work on other people's wells. They, it's like a it's not it's not like far away big oil. It's like woven into the fabric of life, which, mm -hmm. by the way, is a challenge for decarbonization, as you might imagine. It's mm -hmm. not like the capital city and big oil comes and subjects itself on you in a lot of the U.S. There, there's almost a little bit more skepticism, not on environmental reasons. It's like, what about will our local oil economy go away if, there, if sure, nuclear Sure, what's going to happen to jobs and all this kind it's of stuff? Same, totally. same as on almost any other energy tra totally. transition story. So there's a mix. I definitely think that if all oil industry executives and well executives are employees they are hired and fired they can be they can be cut tomorrow you're really looking at the board level and the board is representing shareholders or you know they're members mm -hmm. of the board that big capital funds put on at that level they have been against nuclear that is actually really important because you know in some ways let's say that a a nuclear exec or a oil executive is talented at doing whatever his board tells him to do, right? Well, if the board says it's time for nuclear, that person could or maybe might just go do nuclear, right? But if the board, this interlocking connection of the absolute elites of capitalist society, if they are from the generation that was most scared about nuclear, they don't I think want you're their giving them you're into. giving them so much free reign here. Like these people aren't even scared of the bloody climate crisis. It's not fear. It's profits. It's this it's the status quo. It's hard. And this is the other thing that we have seen. Like it is actually quite hard for energy companies to transition. Like this is what we're seeing in oil and gas right now. They're a little bit panicked. They don't know how to just become renewable energy. Uh, companies. It's likely that it's going to be different companies, quite frankly, that come up. Like this is this is the the era of dinosaurs dying out. Like I very 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 much doubt that those boards of directors are not doing nuclear because you know they were kids in the sixties. You know I think well, it's about protecting thing, profits. It's, 
it's actually when you're trying to pursue the unknown for either profit or for fear or whatever, if you don't know whether you would make profit in nuclear, but you do know that you only meet as a board a few times a year, how do you decide what to spend time on when instead you could be spending time on how to squeeze more money out or how many people to fire to get more profit or whatever? You need, you need to prioritize time at that level. Uh -huh. What they do. I'm telling you what they do. I'm not a board member. So yeah. what they do is prioritize time. And if they have an embedded, scared seven or eight year old from 1964, 65 doing drills under their desk as the, as the sirens go off and saying, all right, children, this is what it'll sound like to die in the 60s. Like, yeah, I, I, if you've seen that comic about air shows. Anyway, like that little kid is needing to decide what to use as a 75, 70 year old or whatever how to use time and focus at the board level. And I'm telling you from the fact that now that nuclear is having a moment and obviously climate change is having a moment, is going to keep having a moment, whatever they decide to do, yes or no, it's having a moment and they're thinking and talking about it. I'm starting to hear those timid conversations start up for the first time, either secondhand, because I'm not interacting typically with board member level people. I'm not there yet. Is it going to happen? I don't know. But above me people are having conversations then telling me hey i work as an advisor to like an elite headhunter group that finds people for boards here's what we're hearing on nuclear what do you say about that so i'm hearing like second and third hands that people are having very timid conversations that edge lord uh dudes at 18 years old are having in the youtube comments back in 2010 about thorium reactors they're just they're just it's just now trickling up to, to that level fossil and fuel. we don't know yes and i'm i'm not sure what the outcome is going to be there's a number of fossil fuel companies that have reached out to get advice from people like me now it's not like the board members but it's probably people who want the board members above them who control everything and you know take profits and stuff they want the board members to notice nuclear hi we're in the fossil fuel company we want you to notice nuclear okay. now we All think right. it's important okay okay but in other cases it may be coming top down Somebody at the board says, okay. hey, has ExxonMobil thought about nuclear? Let's not talk, oh, hy let's not talk hypotheticals. Okay. Um, right. Interesting. Let's talk about the feasibility of it, though, because it takes it a long... Those are what is happening. What? You, well, you said maybe. I'm basically maybe saying conversations that I dire have direct knowledge of. Yeah. So that it is coming, but you said people have reached out. It, 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 so there are many companies with many different interests, downstream, upstream. I'm just saying that the spread of conversations is that range. Well, okay, great. Let's talk about the feasibility of it. How long does it take to get a nuclear plant online? Because from what I've understood, part of the the issue now with like nuclear was great back in the day. And if you look at France, the you know, the one country that bet on it. Um <laughs> They bet they bet everything on it. They bet everything and they on it. They didn't do it they didn't do it in a particularly capitalist way, as you may as you may <laughs> understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think the the energy Industry in France is still falls under the free market, um, but it's a more socialist-ish state. Um, so they bet on it and they're very much reaping the rewards. But from what I understand, it takes like 40 years to get a new nuclear plant online. That's, that's a little long. Okay. So um, in the very worst cases, companies started nuclear plants during an era of super high inflation in the 70s. They decided, oh, we don't even need this much electricity. They stopped and then they completed plants a generation later. So um, the biggest socialist experiment in a way in, in U.S. history, Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, they in 2016 finished a nuclear plant that they had started back in uh, like the 70s. <laughs> but that is an extreme case. China is building new reactors at existing power plants in about four to four and a half years each. And it's building power plants from scratch in about five and a half to six years. So once you build the power plant, you can start adding reactors really, really rapidly. Um, and they're, they just became very good at building. Mm. Um, they're the best at building solar, best at building wind, nah. uh, best at building hydro, if you want to call it that. Um, they, and they, they are, the are the, they're the best at building, <laughs> building uh, nuclear reactors. They build yeah. them really fast. And the ones that they build that perform the best at the moment they're American designs that we aren't building in America. Mm, that's interesting. It's very weird. And, mm. and part of what I'm, I'm trying to do is figure out if the Chinese can build American reactor designs in America using kits and parts that come from American companies and supply chains, the blueprints from America. What, 
why can't we replace coal plants with those, provide even more jobs without the pollution, cheap power for, for 100 years if you build it right? Why can't we do that? And mm. that's, that is where we're struggling to move forward in, let's say, neoliberal electricity markets, in my opinion, is struggling to properly value long-term thinking and planning that is working out so successfully in nuclear grids elsewhere. Mm. I mean, I think long-term thinking and planning and getting your head free from the, the jaws of neoliberalism is kind of the problem in everywhere, including the top offices of politics. But before we get into like the the waste thing and the Which radioactivity thing, on. and we should yeah. we will we will just explain this thing about coal plants. Do, are you saying that we can like transform coal plants that we're shutting down into nuclear uh, nuclear plants? Yes. Now some people have this crazy vision of like you take literally everything at the coal plant, you leave it there, including the parking lot, and you just like <laughs> take the coal boiler and you substitute out like that nasty burning stuff, and you just put in the little nuclear reactor. That's going to be a little bit of an extreme view. In most cases, the really, really valuable things are the following. The water source that flows by and can carry a small amount of waste heat out. I know we're trying to stop global warming. The waste heat from a, from a thermal power plant is, like a coal plant, is a vanishing, vanishing contribution to global warming. Like thousands of times more or, or more, I need to check the math on that, is the CO2 from the burning of the thing. Because that's the greenhouse effect, right? Mm -hmm. So the, although you do have waste heat from a nuclear plant, the substitution out of the pollution, especially CO2, that's what makes a, the radical difference. And at that point, it becomes cleaner than like solar that has to be manufactured typically by a coal plant yeah, to, to, to forge the solar cells and everything, right? So on a comparison basis, although you need a little bit of that cooling water, it, the payoff ends up worth it. But that access to water does matter. Um, it's just nuclear plants keep them a lot, keep the water a lot cleaner than uh, coal plants in terms of the surrounding emissions. Okay, then rail mm -hmm. lines. If you have a rail line to a site, you can move in heavy equipment much better. There's a reason why rail and railroads inspired so much, say, socialist thinking and, and, and development is because you can suddenly transport things for extremely low cost at very predictable schedules. That rail line, what is it used for at a coal plant? Bringing in coal, like 120 <laughs> cars of coal every single day for, to power a million people, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. That rail line hookup, that's heavy infrastructure, and it is very hard to substitute that if you don't have it. Here's another one. Uh, hundreds of people who are used to having a power plant nearby have it pay their school property taxes, you know, to build the school and want to keep that going. If people don't want you to build near them, in at least America, it becomes a very difficult thing to build. Okay, here's another one. This one is perhaps the most precious of all, Rachel. The grid, the grid, the grid, the grid, the grid. You need a big old power line to bring in or carry out energy. And it's almost impossible to expand the grid the way people want it expanded. Why? Because even a single town, underserved community, um, big landowner, you name it, they can all unite together and a one little patch of land and you block a power line, right? And you might struggle over that for years where people say, no, this is for the common good. We want to build it. And they're saying, no, it's for your profit for the common good. And anyway, if you already have a power line taking away the electricity from the coal plant, all you have to do is just hook up. Even if you build the coal plant here and the nuclear plants over here, and the power line comes and meets them both and then heads, heads out to the big city on the coasts, that is the most precious thing of all. Mm. Those are what you got to keep. Mm. That is such, those the are water, such interesting points. The rail and the people and the grid. Mm. And if I had to rank them in order at this point, at this point in 2023, late 2023, grid's number one, people are number two, uh, water is number three, and then rail is number four but you put them all together for a big Kentucky coal plant, and you have something where capitalists and socialists and uh, climate deniers and, and hardcore pro-nuclear techno-optimist greenies, everybody sees a winning play here mm. if our generation can learn to build again. Oh, what a line. Yeah. I mean, Biden's certainly hoping that we can. Um, now, one group that might be against it would might be uh, a group 
you know, just sort of the the anti nuclear, not even just uh, necessarily environmentalists, but people that are very nervous about what we do with radioactive waste because we still haven't quite figured that out. From what I understand, we can store it for a really, really, really long time. Um, but and there's talks of like shooting it off into space. From what I've seen on Twitter, yeah, not great. <laughs> um, but people are nervous. So talk, walk me through it. How dangerous is it? And what I will say here is that. Um, even with, where was it? Um, oh, where is that place in Eastern Europe that had the... Chernobyl. Chernobyl, thank you. Even with Chernobyl, the amount of deaths that have happened at a nuclear plant relative to um, uh, like oil rigs or, or other fossil fuel plants is astronomically lower. It's it's crazy actually how safe these things are typically for the workers, even when you uh, relativize for the amount and scale and all this kind of stuff. And the workers are the ones most exposed. Uh, even even Chernobyl blowing up, it was really hard to find that many deaths. Not that this is excusable ever. We we want perfection in nuclear, but um, most of the people who died were the workers and first responders, not people in the community. And that's the most violent nuclear disaster ever. Hmm. So, so yeah, you're right. So then what do we do with the waste? Here's the thing. Here's what you might call the maximum solution. You put it in a granite bedrock that hasn't changed in a billion years. So the Finns, the Finnish government and the Finnish people and the Finnish nuclear utilities, they worked together. They found a spot next to their power plant and they put in the holes in the ground. So they are ready to start putting in nuclear waste. They have a like a almost like a multi-step thing where they put the nuclear waste, which is just a just the fuel rods coming out of the nuclear plant. The fuel rods come out of the reactor. They sit in water, cool off for a few years. Then you take them out and you put them in a holder canister. It's made of iron or something. Put that canister in copper. That means if there's any corrosion, it goes from outside in, not in, it, not from inside out, and it corrodes the copper. It doesn't corrode the, the fuel. Mm. And then you cover it with this like uh, special clay that just like, expands if any water touches it it expands like a self-sealing glue almost mm -hmm. and then you you lock it in place with that clay in a hole in granite bedrock and if you do that you'll spend some money it's not too much money but you will spend some money and then it will be locked away kind of forever under Finnish law you have to be able to retrieve it it'll be so expensive you would just get new stuff you won't you won't reuse it, it it'll be that expensive but under Finnish law you have to be able to retrieve it. Mm. And that makes the cost go up and the engineering gets harder, but they are able to retrieve it if they have to. Mm. Um, so that's the, that's the extreme solution. So we have it. The F Finland can show everybody how to do it. There you go. What but if since nobody has ever been hurt by nuclear waste from a nuclear plant, the way it's being stored currently, which is just in a concrete capsule, uh, I think we do that. Because the amount of waste there is, it's like a, it's like a parking lot per reactor. It's just not. I've I've gone and looked at the waste from a bunch of different nuclear plants. Now I'm telling you, it is extremely boring. The only thing that makes nuclear waste not boring is if you are allowed to take pictures for Instagram or Twitter. In which case, you can pose with the waste. You can go up. You can hug it. I have a a fairly intense friend who is now a young mother. But she, when pregnant, went and found the spiciest nuclear waste in the world. It's the, it's the core that melted at Three Mile Island nuclear plant. And my, my friend and colleague, uh, Maddie Hilly, to prove that she can do the calculations and she knows it's safe and she trusts, she trusts science, basically, she went and stood with her baby, her fetus, in her, in her body next to the canister holding the waste from the melted down core of Three Mile Island, the worst uh, you know, the third worst uh, meltdown in the world in most people's minds. Wow. Okay. And that's the same holder that let's say these canisters only last for 200 years or 100 years. Then you just make a law that says you have to replace them every 40 years. Okay. But here's, okay. So, he, but, he, but here's, but here's, I, I think here's, here's the problem, right? With, with the radioactive waste problem. Given we are looking at increasing political instability, uh, whether that's international or national. And given it looks like we're not going to solve the ecological crises um, and all of its accompanying crises, and given um, 
you know, the boys in charge are looking ever so keen to to bomb each other. Um, and given that people aren't very good at long-term planning, certainly in the West, is it safe? Is it safe to use a thing that demands essentially a stable, continuous government in order to continue caretaking this radioactive substance when it's actually pretty likely that the world could either like collapse into, you know, a third world war, um, maybe by the end of this decade, or civilization itself could collapse and the infrastructure that we depend on could begin to degrade. And then if we don't have people looking after that, um, that waste, then the impact could be horrible. So the big thing I got to challenge you is the impact can't really be horrible. The waste just isn't, it isn't that fun or easy to, to, to weaponize or to use for anything. It's, uh, when I say boring, I mean really, really boring. Uh -huh. Like if you're able to break into these hundred ton holders and you break out the, you break off the concrete and then you cut through the, the steel and then you got a hold of the waste and you opened it up and then you didn't die somehow. Um, depending on how fresh the fuel is. Very big difference depending on whether it's 10-year-old fuel or 60-year-old fuel. But putting that aside, it's just not that useful for anything. And you might as well get the cancer treatment radiation material from like a hospital, which historically has been able to be misused and mishandled and kill people. But the nuclear waste hasn't. And that's because it's just too, it's just too hard to mess around with. I suppose I'm not even talking about people home making nuclear bombs, but just, you know. Oh, these... I mean the pros too. Um, That's why. Okay, well, I'm not talking about people home making nuclear bombs. I'm talking about, you know, the, the capsules or whatever the, the degrading over time. And oh. then that radioactive waste leaking out into the world. It's so the degrading over time and leaking into the world at that point, you're talking about really, really, really low uh, levels of radiation over extremely long time periods, which is the same thing as saying not dangerous. You need you need a higher radiation. You need a shorter time period. You need to like push it on people somehow. So mm -hmm. if you're worried about the abandonment and decay, I'm not not that worried about it. Um, that not because I hate people. I'm doing nuclear instead of going off to Wall Street and making actual money because I I, I love people and I think that we have a fighting chance. You. You said, given we're not going to solve, solve, solve. I hear you. But I wake up every day thinking there's got to be a way to at least make it a better situation than before, which is how I found my way to nuclear very late in my education. That hunt, that desire to say, we're not dead yet. We're not gone yet. Mm. And gosh darn it, I'm going to see if I can't help a little. <laughs> so that's how I found it. One of the questions I had to ask myself was, what about the nuclear waste over really long periods of time? That is something that Based, again, no one can say for sure, but that's true for almost everything. Based on my reading of history, we're good on the doses that could physically come out of even heavily damaged nuclear fuel assemblies over medium lengths of time, which is, of course, much more hazardous than long lengths of time for two reasons. One, that medium lengths, you could have a concentrated amount of radiation come out while it's still hot enough to matter, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you wait for 10,000 years, and you severely damage the radiation holding casks, well, the stuff that comes out is just not that strong anymore. It's just not. And so what I would really be concerned about is the nearer term when the spicy shit is still in the canister sure. waiting to release. And in that medium term, I think we're going to have a lot of issues. We're going to have 99 problems, but the nuclear waste ain't one, to be quite, to be quite frank. And you may say, am I just saying, trust me, bro? Well, if you could, you have a pretty good view of problems around the world. If you could join me at some nuclear waste, like holding areas, I think you'd see, you'd intuitively see, damn, these walls thick. Uh, it's not that nothing could happen. It's just all the other walls that are way thinner and guard dangerous materials or important infrastructure or almost anything else besides the waste itself. Um, we're going to have issues with those first. Yeah. And then the health effects of the radiation are just, let me put it this way. Chernobyl blew up in 1986, right? The power plant did not close. Like the reactors did not turn off until 2000. That's the last year they made electricity. And then the workers protested that we don't want our plant shut down. This is our jobs. We already fixed the plant so it wouldn't blow up anymore. Why are you shutting down our power plant? So mm -hmm. like if the most dangerous disaster in the history of nuclear 
which we learned a lot from, including not to use that type of reactor or not to build any more, at least. Um, we didn't even shut down the power plant. That compares profoundly well with almost any other um, industrial or energy producing activity. You can bet Piper Alpha didn't make any more oil after the platform blew up. Um, that was the it. that was it for it, you know. Mm, no, but Chernobyl a, nuclear plant point. kept operating for fourteen years. Yeah, and it wasn't even like oh Moscow was forcing us to. No, Ukraine was operating Chernobyl nuclear plant until they got a payoff suitable to turn on a, an alternative reactor that would produce just as much electricity. If that makes sense. So. <sighs> Okay, that is a very, very good argument. I suppose I'm worried about a world in which bombs start getting rained down on, you know, sensitive locations, put it that way. Um, not worried about people breaking in, worried about those thick walls, you know, being destroyed. So in this in case, let me term. say, let's say bombing happened on the nuclear waste holding areas of nuclear plants, right? Um at that point, a lot of things have gone wrong. Let's just be clear. Then that would almost certainly be able to produce detectable radiation signatures, like you would be able to detect it in many areas. And then the amount of damage would not really be from the radiation. It would be how scared we are of radiation at that time in that crisis compared to other fears. Because uh, even in Chernobyl, there's a bunch of people that never evacuated. Why? Because they weren't scared, so they just didn't. Or they were scared, but they're like, I just YOLO. I'm or here. I have nowhere else to go. Right. And that was the spicy. Well, if you if you wanted to leave from the Chernobyl area, there were places to go. You could get your residence permit in other communal apartments. Like that wasn't that wasn't the big issue. It's just for a lot of people, that wasn't that pleasant. They were like, I'm old enough that if I die, I die. I've lived. I don't really, you know, I'm going back. There are people who have lived there continuously. Um, the Japanese government did not give so much choice to a lot of the folks around Fukushima Daiichi. However, they have given them the choice, the permission to return. Um, and this was stuff that was radically more dangerous in terms of human health impact at the quantities and the um, spiciness level. It was very recently in a reactor. It wasn't the decayed particles over a long period. So... Another thing is you've got heavy stuff that just doesn't want to spread very much. All of this is saying, yes, if you intended to do precision bombing of nuclear waste, you could make there be a radiation signature come out of the facility. You could do that. It, it, and the choice of whether it hurt us would be a little bit down to how much panic there is in the evacuation rather than um, the radiation itself. Which okay. is, by the way, not true for attacking online reactors itself. But uh, you didn't ask that specifically in this question. Mm. It's just a grim situation we came in to having to look at because of the, the war in Ukraine. People are like, oh, what if they bomb the reactor? I'm like, they probably won't. But if you insist on me answering the question, here's the scenario where we're looking at. Most people, though, were asking your question, Rachel, which was, what if there's bombing, intentional or otherwise, of the waste storage. Mm. In which case, my answer is, it's stuff that's decayed for a long time. You would definitely have a pop of radioactive signatures and detectors around. You would definitely need to send in some scientists to say, okay, what materials got out? Like, if it's really heavy stuff, it goes poo. And it just, it won't, it doesn't want to leave and go visit cities far away, for example. So you would need to check how much of the heavy stuff splattered around. What's the radioactive levels for the particles that got out? Do they go into the body? Do they not? Do they only hurt you if they go in or they can they hurt on the skin? Do they get combined with your bones and sit there bleaking, bleeping, bleeping for a long time or not? So that's all the, that, those are like the concerns of nuclear medicine, of nuclear uh, radioisotopes in the body. And what you would almost certainly find based on the mix of shit and how much there is at nuclear waste over you know, let's say this app starts happening 10 years from now to 50. It would be more of like an elective evacuation, I'm saying. I mean, if that makes sense, not really like uh -huh. you have to leave because it will hurt you. It'll be more like, yeah, you probably won't be able to sell your house for much money in the next 30 years. I mean, you can see why people prefer the idea of solar and wind um, on uh, with regards to that. It doesn't 
feel like uh, playing with a dangerous technology, although the environmental impacts of mining for the materials for solar and wind cannot be understated and are a huge problem and, and will both, demand both a contraction. Types of facilities have to be built properly. One of the biggest crises the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., has been dealing with the last few years is a, a solar farm that was put on farming lands in the Midwest of the U.S., and it caused an entire layer of topsoil filled with pesticides and other chemicals to wash into a river and it killed almost everything in the river. And it was just this huge. Anyway, my point is, are there ways of building solar that don't do that? Yeah. Did they? No, they, they messed it up. Hmm. Here's the other thing, though. I think people are intuitively realizing there's something special about the grid. There's something special about electricity. Yeah. And the sun goes down every day. And the experts who say, oh, that's no problem. Just spend 10 times more than the cost of solar to have cheap solar during the day work at night. But then that's not, that's not really cheap solar anymore. It's expensive nighttime solar. We don't, we don't really have a cheap answer for that. So nuclear takes up much less area, depending on what numbers you're looking at for the carbon footprint. It seems pretty clear at this point that nuclear is going to be cleaner than solar on, on, on like global warming. Um, hmm. at which point it's a little more even, I suppose. Then the nuclear waste, if you merely visit it, if we had much better accessibility of public tours of nuclear waste, I think people would just intuitively stop worrying about it. I 100% hear your fears on the nuclear waste, whether they're your own or you're transmitting what you've heard from others. These are fears that are now competing with many other fears, which is what opened up this very wide ranging discussion in the first place, which is like, what about the connection to war? What about the connection to the sum of all the rest of our fears? What I am finding for myself, I was not scared of the waste, but I understand that that's just me. What I'm finding is that people start having other fears like the environment or even for providing for their own family and jobs and the other things that you'll see in every part of the energy transition. And they see me, picture of me on Twitter standing next to the nuclear waste and they're like, that's it. I'm like, that's it. And they're like, but can it be bombed? I was like, I guess. It's this stick, but I guess somebody could bomb it. And then their fears kind of migrate onto other things or just go away. That's not mm -hmm. saying we can predict the future. It's just saying in the intuitive sum of all the other things that threaten us in a moment of crisis, that is not one that is particularly relevant once people have heard the evidence and have seen pictures or even better seen it with their own eyes. Okay. I mean, I think that to pull back to the big picture, I personally am not somebody that's like particularly worried about radioactive waste, but I don't think that um, what we've said in this conversation either like would necessarily alleviate people's like very, very sort of understandable concerns because the real problem is kind of like the economic paradigm that we live in of domination of, you know, military industrial complex of warmongering, essentially. You know, if we didn't, if we didn't have so many people that were so keen to go to war, it wouldn't really be an issue. Um, I think we're having to think about everything through the lens of the, the power structures within the world as it is. What is very interesting and exciting about the energy transition is how could infrastructure change those power dynamics? How could energy change those power dynamics? Um, and I've heard a couple of people say, you know, and I've said it as well on the show, that you can't really have a military run on renewable energy um, or rebuildable energy, depending on the term you want to use. Like military is so inherently tied to, to fossil fuels that it's really exciting to think about the new world order that could come through by changing our energy source. Um, another thing though, that I hear a lot is like, whatever the future looks like, it needs to be diverse. Like the ecosystems of energy sources that we're using need to be diverse. So if China can get nuclear plants off the ground in four and a half years, it doesn't surprise me given they built a hospital during COVID in three days. That doesn't necessarily, I, it, maybe we would be able to do that, um, in the West under sort of emergency protocols. I, I don't know. Um, but it seems that a mix of all of these different energy sources would hopefully be kind of the the way to go. Um, I did have a, a question for you about how much 
A, how much uranium we have left. Because Simon Michaud in um, Finland, the researcher, says that he's really pro the idea of nuclear, but that we, you know, we actually don't have enough uranium in the ground to do that. So nuclear would have to be part of a wider ecosystem. Okay, you're shaking your head. I disagree with Simon, unfortunately, for agreements, and fortunately for humanity. No, we've got enough uranium. It's one of those things where we find it whenever we search for it. And we tend to find it in like, well, at least like in Canada, these blobs that are super concentrated. You go down and you you will now have, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million people's worth of energy for like 15 to 20 years. And then you find the next one. Now, we've barely begun searching for it. And if we really got desperate for it, we could economically produce it by squeegeeing it out of just like ocean water washing by. Why? Because there's an even distribution of uranium washed into the world's oceans. If you just squeegee it out. Hmm. And I've seen I've seen prototypes of this technology. It looks like a kelp farm, but the kelp is like yellow sponges instead of uh, green leaves. Mm -hmm. And you just let the ocean wash this way and that way. And then you squeeze out the uranium. And then if wow. you needed to, you could go and use up the nuclear waste because that's got a lot of uranium in it. You just have to change your reactor design to run off the waste instead of the, the okay. fresh uranium. Tell me about that. So is, so there's a kind of recyclable possibility to nuclear yes. energy. I, a lot of people lead with that. I don't because the economics aren't amazing. I'm not talking like, oh, that's because I'm a capitalist or not a capitalist. I'm just like, if you had socialist nuclear energy, socialist nuclear energy is only going to slowly get into it. China is working on it about the same speed everyone else is. They, their new reactor to use the waste can come up soon, but it's like uh, we would be challenged on this way far out. People like the idea of the waste burning reactor because they're like, oh, that closes the cycle. Yes, it does. It does. It would. Right. Um, and that's, that's the story that brought me into nuclear in the first place. Once I got in and realized how much uranium we actually have, how uh, little mining is required, um, how complicated is the recycling process. We'll get there. If we need to, we'll get there. But it's not a first priority. It's, it's where the nuclear tech nerds love to think, um, which, again, I started as a nuclear tech nerd and become, became much more interested in the people afterwards. Um, you know, that's what it feels like to be a young engineer and learn the engineering before you learn about people. Hmm. So... Yes, we can do it. And at that point, we've got a few billion years of uranium and thorium that's pretty, pretty available to us. Thorium is in everything. That's why almost every type of rock is radioactive. Okay. Why almost every mine is radioactive. So, it's so, the thorium and the uranium. So just explain the recycling thing to me. You said it would like close the loop. So that means yes. that the nuclear waste of the nuclear waste energy, what, is not radioactive anymore? Um. It's the the outcome. In other words, there would still be radioactive things coming out, but it's like a 500-year waste, not like 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 year. Oh, wow. So I mean, that in seems other words, what we should the, be doing. It's the fission <laughs> product. So when you break apart a chunky, a chunky atom and mm -hmm. to two smaller bits, those smaller bits typically, they become less radioactive really quickly compared to if you have a larger atom that's just absorbed your uranium or absorbed neutrons doesn't split and just kind of it's called transuranics because they're 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 the elements that are nearer and heavier than uranium and they're weakly radioactive for tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of years they're not a big health risk it's kind of fake news but you can detect it so we we do we do a lot of engineering and nuclear based on fears not about health risks if that makes sense um, and as those fears drop, people may say, hey, why does this nuclear cost so much? And we'll be like, well, you've asked us to have this be OK for a fight. And they're like, well, I don't care. I'm hungry. OK, OK, fine. We'll make it a little cheaper. So I see that potentially happening because of the presence of really strong and experienced regulators. We don't really ratchet down in nuclear. We kind of ratchet the other way, typically. So I don't get into that because I don't want to promise people, hey, hey, quit yelling at me. I'll make it less safe. I promise. Or, you know, I'm not. That's not, that may be what edgy Zoomers say in 10 years or something when they want more nuclear. I'm not going to, I'm a, I want to be a working professional in nuclear. I'm not going to advocate for uh, more difficult 
uh, conversations with the public like that. We have enough as it is, like connection with nuclear war and the waste as it sits. If we want to talk about recycling, though, we can. The French do a two twice through cycle. What that means is the nuclear waste comes out of their reactor. It gets shipped to a plant in Normandy. They chop it up. They dissolve the, the uranium fuel. And then they take the, the, this 500 year, the, the little spicy particles. They put them over here. They put all the uranium and plutonium over here. They put the uranium plutonium back into fuel. And then they put that back into a reactor. Mm -hmm. That's not typically what people dream of when they want the, the ultimate goal of reactor development. They want fast reactors. That is the name of a family of reactor designs that have so many neutrons going in the core that they can transmutate anything to fuel. They can turn anything to like nuclear fuel and use it, including the nuclear waste. You still have those fission fragments, the little particles, but you can presumably, if you want to do this badly enough, you can just pull those out put those in a block of glass and then the glass will still stay stable and secure at least as long as that those particles are still radioactive because it's only a few hundred years. Mm. Sorry, this is all crazy stuff. If, if you want to know why some people are techno optimists, it's because all of these things are physically possible and can be proven. Um, and if you did that, you could make a peaceful, low carbon, nuclear powered world where we would never run out of fuel. It's just we've got a number of steps to get there. Huh. Russia, okay. Russia already operates multiple of these plants. Which ones? Nuclear or? The fast reactors that can transmutate the, the waste. What? They, but but they, cost, they cost about 20% more to operate than the regular. But what are they turning into nuclear? I also just realized that at no point in this conversation did I ask you to explain what happens in a nuclear reactor. Like what? What nuclear fuel actually is, which is completely my fault. No, so it's okay. Maybe... But there are there are also really great videos out there with animations that can show. It. Instead of me sitting here in my chunky sweater and waving my hands like this, people no, would be but... able to see it. But basically, sure. yeah. you take a few chubby atoms, mm -hmm. you put them next to each other. Mm -hmm. Every so often, one of them breaks apart. Just that's just nature. And when it breaks apart, it it releases like a little particle that could break apart another. So if you have them close enough together, you can make a chain reaction. In a nuclear reactor, you want this chain reaction to expand very, very slowly and only get to a certain level. That's what makes nuclear reactors reactors so, instead of bombs. Oh, okay, okay. So what's, okay, so if Russia has got these fast reactor things that you said they can use anything to turn it into nuclear fuel. So they're not run on uranium? Oh, no, 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 they, sorry. Um, you still want to power them with like uranium and or and or plutonium, but you can use that up and keep splitting that up. If you if you have continuous recycling of your fuel and back into the plant, which is again a lot of technology here that's been proposed, been tested at lab bench scale, would need to would need to be worked out into a technology system. And since uranium is so cheap, we haven't really, and since the nuclear waste is so stable and so small, we haven't really bothered. But the story is outstanding and the technology is possible. So wait, so what are those fast reactors then in Russia? Well, at the moment, yeah. they're using um, sort of a, let's say, an enriched, a high fat version of, <laughs> of, of current fuels. And they are working on each step in the process of making it to where they eventually recycle everything. At the moment, they're powering them, um, at least one of the, the biggest one, I think they're now powering on entirely recycled fuel. That's uranium and plutonium from the other types of reactors. This is, hang on, this is mad. So, oh. people People stopped this in the 50s and 60s. They started fighting it because they're like, that'll just cause us to occupy the earth and use up all its resources if we get this much energy. So, in Russia, there's these like fully recycled, they're running on fully recyclable, hang on, I need, I need help. So, that does that mean that the reactors are producing energy and producing waste and then reusing that same waste to yeah no I need more help what does it mean yes so <laughs> trying to think about how I would say this yeah so as the reactors operate they convert stuff in them that isn't good fuel into good fuel because that stuff captures extra neutrons there's tons of neutrons 
in this type of reactor, tons of extra neutrons. In traditional reactors, there's not enough extra neutrons. You got to put the right fuel in, use it up, and then take, put fresh stuff in. What's in this type stuff? of reactor, what? What's the stuff? Mainly natural uranium with okay. a slightly higher amount of uh, uranium. To, so now we've gotten as far as we can go, I think, without getting into saying element names with uh, that's, hang on, atomic that's, numbers. Oh, okay. Okay. I, what, <laughs> what I'm trying to understand is, okay, if you have like an, an input, so uranium and plutonium, fresh uranium and plutonium is going in. Wait, wait, wait. No such thing as fresh plutonium. There's Ooh. no natural plutonium, really. Oh. All plutonium that's there is there because um, someone cooked here, basically. You know, if somebody cooked here. Breaking uranium, Bad. That's where the... <laughs> I mean, okay, you want a Breaking Bad reference. No, uh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Please let me, please let me. So we've got cooked plutonium and uranium from the mines going into this reactor where things are happening faster. Um, neutrons. There's the name more... is misleading. In general, More neutrons, neutrons are traveling faster when you usefully use them. Right. Then in a reactor that is not called a slow reactor, but effectively it's a slow neutron reactor and a fast neutron reactor. So there's more useful work going on in this reactor. Um, there are more exotic uh, nuclear possibilities going on in a okay, fast okay, reactor. Okay, okay, okay. No, okay, right. Let's go back. Let's go back. Right. Okay, so you've got... I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure we don't say anything scientifically wrong, but I'm also trying to keep it as accessible as possible. That's fine. So we've got cooked plutonium and uranium from the mines going in to this special reactor. Or, or or uranium from the spent fuel also. It could be either from the mines or from the spent fuel. See, this is what I'm trying to get at. What is the... You how, get to choose. My point how, is no, you let can me, choose. Let me ask my question. How yeah. much fresh, ura fresh uranium and cooked plutonium has to go in to keep it going? Because... Or can it just go off of recycled? Like, where is the you where is the waste fuel coming from? Right. <laughs> the end goal of all of this, where I okay. think you're both you're getting with your question, what the end goal that solves uh, Simon Michaud's problem mm -hmm. is, where you're barely placing a tiny sprinkle of the natural uranium or thorium from the mines. Like you barely sprinkle it in, and then you get like ninety times more fuel, more energy out for every little bit you sprinkle in. And you get to use that much more of like the, you, the waste coming out is like almost nothing. So you're sprinkling in a little bit of uranium from the mines. The amount of uranium and plutonium and thorium naturally being cooked up and produced in the reactor is keeping it going. And then you take out just a few of these little bitty fr fission fragments like salt and pepper that comes out and sparkles a little. You just take out a little of that and keep it out because that can, it, you know, it can mess up your reactions over time if they build up. So then you just have like a continuously cooking cycle where you barely put in any mined material, you get all the energy out, and you barely take in any of the out any of the the waste product. Is and this... at that point, at that point, we're powering this planet until the sun expands and burns off the atmosphere. Okay. Is this is this is this fusion? No. Is that fission? It's all fission. It's all about breaking apart chubby atoms rather than combining small atoms. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about nuclear fission, which is this. This is the dream. Like, and a world run on nuclear fission is indeed beautiful. But in I fact, thought... we have fuel for so long, we might even be able to figure out fusion. <laughs> oh, so it's not fusion. No, fusion is splitting tiny atoms. Okay, which fission one's, which is, one's oh, sorry, the dream? Sorry, sorry. Fusion. See, this happens to everybody, by the way. <laughs> Fusion is combining tiny atoms. No, no, no. Okay, no, that's not why. Fusion I mean. is splitting what is, large what is the atoms. one that we're doing today? Fission. Okay, so today was nuclear fission. It was fusion, all fission is like the pipe dream. Certainly, people think it's coming. They put many billions of dollars into it last year, so they think it's coming. Uh, but I thought the joke amongst engineers is that it's always twenty years off. So I, was... I would repeat that joke. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Be... <laughs> okay. So fusion is the future. Fission is the present. But there's this like new... Future fission. What? Future fission is what you might call this advanced recycling where you're doing a closed loop system. Right. So, this is, so, yeah. this, is, so this is the kind of evolution of the technological process of this yeah. thing that we're already doing. And Russia's built some of these reactors, but they're not doing and they, that and exact thing And they make commercial amounts of electricity. They make but electricity to sell to the grid. But are they doing that? 
they're they're getting closer in stages. Okay, so they're sense. not doing it. <laughs> well, um, okay. So what their current stage is is using entirely the recycled fuel in this, but they're not. They haven't closed off this. In other words, they're going to do that with that fuel. They're going to use that fuel for a, a, quite a while. Then they're going to take it out. I don't know if they're planning to recycle that to prove a point because it's so much easier just to put in the fresh waste, I suppose, than the the waste anyway, of the waste. Yeah, you. We can do all these material balances, and what you see is they're doing. You're in stages, getting closer to that point. But most people think that you want to redesign your reactor from scratch to specifically be designed to be a closed cycle. And that includes choosing what material you use for the fuel itself instead of a ceramic, like a coffee mug. Like this is, we use uranium ceramic now. I'm okay. Not, um, and, it, <laughs> and it's very hard and, and, and tough. And instead they think you need to go to a metal fuel that will be easier to recycle in stages. But so a metal they, they that is also uranium. It would be uranium and plutonium and whatever other junk right, okay. needs to get burned off in the recycle. I know that these questions must be inane to you, but I'm... they are not. They are very difficult. So if I wanted to, I could nerd out and make it almost impossible to understand. Please, but don't. that's only because I. Yeah, I like it's literally... almost there anyway. <laughs> my apologies. My apologies. There's a bunch of non-intuitive surprises in nuclear, and mm. there's some of it is irreducibly complicated. Some of it is explainable, and trying to figure out which of those is is the challenge of the, I guess, the nuclear storyteller that I'm working through. Okay, so this so this future fission, which is the evolution of the of the fission that we're doing today. I mean, that sounds sounds great. Sounds too good to be true, but it sounds great. <laughs> um, and I mean, how far along is Russia uh, from completing that? When will they? It, depending on the way you want to put it, they are. If, if stage one is getting nuclear reactors that work and put out waste. And stage two is getting fast reactors that work. They put out a lot less waste per unit electricity. That's the stage they're in now. Stage three is they eat their own waste. So the mm. snake eating its tail, Ouroboros closing the cycle, mm. the dream. They are maybe one reactor, advanced reactor design away. There are people in other countries building reactors or working on them now that would be part of a perfectly closed cycle, at which point you just need a quicker way to do the recycling itself on the site. And that's the part that uh, several labs around the world are working on. Like South Korea is working on pyroprocessing technology that could like melt down the fuel, quickly put it back in the reactor, like oh, melt it down, then reform it and put it back in. Where in the, the point of the melting is to get out the particles you don't need anymore mm -hmm. and to put in a little bit of the fresh stuff and then put it back in. Oh, that's so interesting. So what would be the waste, the stuff that you don't need anymore? Vision particles, fission fragments. These are like um, things on the atomic table that are sized like 20, uh, atomic numbers like 20 to um, 180 or whatever. Like, uh, let me just try to think. Strontium, for example. Strontium, there's some unstable isotopes that are most concerned to health if they were to get out because it can, it's, strontium can act like calcium and be, get in your bones. Okay. It's very hard to do. It's not... It, this is the things that we worry about and we make sure isn't an issue for the public, but that strontium can be put it, taken out, locked in a, a block of glass, like smoky, dark colored glass. You just lock it in and then you can put it in a facility. I've visited those facilities. Like in the Netherlands, I've walked on top of these canisters that, that uh, hold the strontium and radioactive, um, say, uh, uh, other things that are the mid-scale elements in terms of size on the periodic table, the ones in the middle, those radioactive ones are not useful in a reactor, really, even mm -hmm. a recycling reactor. So you take them out and you put them in a block of glass and you can just hold them. And they're just going to be radioactive for a few hundred years and then they're okay. Hmm. God, it is really exciting, isn't it? That is, kind of. But yeah. it causes people to ignore the human size that we do have worries. There are economic system worries. There are, there are issues of consent. There are issues of inclusion. Those are things that I find after I've learned the technology, I'm like, okay, technology, we can get that part. Can we get the people? Can we do right by people? I think we can, but it's something we're still working on now. Mm. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very important question whenever thinking about how to design the future, right? Because not 
I, not very much in our current world is designed um, for the benefit of people. That's that much is obvious. And the energy, God, the energy industry is really, really proving that right now. Um, so I think that's a very, I was going to say noble, but it's not. That's the right, <laughs> that's the right attitude. So well, I, attitude and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I will say that something that feels, that gives me a lot of hope right now is that there are people from the hard right to the hard left finding their way towards the hope of nuclear and each side wants to do it their way. What I think is so fascinating is that nuclear is a technology of such permanent abundance and low environmental harm that it doesn't matter if you want to do nuclear because you just want profits or just want to, you just want to get rich or, or have a job for your family, screw everybody else. It ends up having the good effects that you're looking at in the broader frame. If you're like, I want there to be union jobs. I want uh, workers to be able to whistleblow against management. I want public ownership of electricity infrastructure. It, it does that too, hmm. um, just because it's, it kind of comes out of the physics of the problem. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it feels good that there's something out there where the engineering tends to determine really lovely pro-human politics. Absolutely. That's a, a wonderful quote. Um, right. I know I've kept you way past when I was meant to, and I'm really, really grateful for you to stay on and answer these questions. Um, I'm just trying well, to and think. Your, your questions were awfully perceptive and very interesting. And you could see that one could keep burrowing down on any one of the things we barely touched yeah. on. And I bet, I bet people are going to see this and comment, oh, he barely answered this question or this concern. He only said that. And then we didn't get sources. Well, yes, this is why people find nuclear and then they can spend their whole lives digging down, both for and against, I, I might say. Mm. It's absolutely fascinating. It gets to the keys of life and death, uh, safety and war on our planet. And the answers are not permanent. They, I mean, I think they're as close to permanent as we can get in this world. I'm against Simon Michaud. I think it is a permanent solution but we will never stop talking about what it means. Hmm. I think I'm also nervous of the word permanent um, being bandied about with regards to human projects. Okay, can I say, yeah. on the timescales of when the sun is likely to cook the earth, th we may kill ourselves or save ourselves many times before then. I'm just saying, on the, on the amount of uranium and thorium we have, that we can reach is on the scale of having enough power for 10 billion people to live medium to high energy lifestyles without carbon emissions for billions of years. Whether we're going to last that long, we don't know. Whether it's going to be 1 billion, 1 million, 1,000, 10 billion, 100 billion, I don't know. But we, the fuel supply is going to last long enough that we're going to be having debates like this for a very, very long time. Hopefully. I mean, I think it is important Like, you know, Simon's research does show otherwise. And I understand that what you said is we've, we've barely gone looking for uranium. Um, but it could just be that maybe there isn't that much out there. I mean, that could also... We, no, we, no, no. We can test right? any drop of water in the ocean anywhere in the world. We know it's there. The question okay. is, can you sponge it out for cheap? Okay. And the thing about nuclear is because you get so much electricity out of so little fuel, especially when those in those advanced recycling reactors, right? People originally started working on that advanced recycling because they thought we didn't have enough uranium. Hmm. So when you include more advanced reactors or getting it out of the oceans, we're good. We're good at that point. And the Simon Me shows have always been proven wrong in resource struggles, actually, for better or worse. But they what, what do you mean? We end up finding the material. We find more oil. We find enough coal to burn our atmosphere to a crisp, right? We can find it. That's not, the issue is sometimes not that it's there. The issue is that it's there, if that makes sense. Well, we've run out, we're running out of oil now. But we know that those reserves are depleting. The assumption is that we hit peak oil in 2008. And we yeah, know but that, that appears to be peak demand, Rachel. Not like we could produce more. Um, demand, demand is higher than ever. Like the fossil fuel uh, production and consumption is higher this year than ever before. I, I understand, but I guess when I well, let's not let's not get into people oil and gas here. 
for the sake of carbon dioxide emissions, I think it would be very good if peak oil has been reached, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that we cannot rest on our laurels that peak oil has been reached. A, a balance between how much people are using and how much they're making, that may reach a peak, but it may be if people want more, we're able to find more. We just have to be ready and provide a good alternative energy source that doesn't make carbon emissions. That's no, but, no, but hang on, because we, no, we know, because we know that we, we've used up most of the premium oil. We're now in shale oil, which is a is lower energy density and higher, um, lower energy return on investment as well. And we essentially, the economics of it is that maybe there will be oil lower down, but it's going to be too expensive. to. It won't make sense to, to pull it up, essentially. So we are producing the shale oil and gas. Sadly for me, who wanted to save nuclear plants that were shut down for no other reason than the gas was discovered underneath them. But um, sadly for me, we're discovering how to get that oil and gas out at like a fraction of the cost that we did a decade ago which means that there's that much more that we can keep getting. Now, I know you might say, oh, well, surely there's a limit. Yeah, I, I'm sure there is too, but it keeps being further away than we keep thinking. And huh. just in uranium, it's a much more extreme situation where we poke around, we start to find uranium everywhere. I mean, I, um, I know we have to wrap up. I'm, I don't really know how to end on this point, though, because that's not what oil experts say. The, I mean, the ones that I speak to, at least the ones that I've interviewed on this show, like we've got 125 years left of uh, natural gas um, in sort of, you know, known reserves and all this kind of stuff, uh, 300 years worth of coal. But oil is like, it's gone. And that's why the world is right now trying to shift to LNG and trying to brand LNG as a transition fuel. Well, careful. I would just say that uh, LNG has uses that oil doesn't really so for example powering natural gas turbines you can kind of do it with oil but it's yeah like you can burn oil for it but it's just it, it's just easier to burn natural gas if you can get it we'll go we'll do hydrocarbons later and by the way none of this is me saying i want there to be more hydrocarbons nor it's me saying shut it off today because I'll, i'm telling you the people that would the people would be very hurt around the world and who knows what politics would come out of that um germany is discovering for itself when they mess up when they mess up energy supplies, politics gets really weird because you don't have to do this or that politics. It's chaos out there. And when people feel like they're being cut off from energy, that's their right or whatever, stuff gets weird. But now we've opened up another thing that we probably shouldn't have opened up, European energy politics. Let's stay away from that. Let's just say there's a bunch of fascinating directions in nuclear. There are concerns that need to keep being addressed that are not, the story has not been written on those concerns. They certainly haven't been written on nuclear war, but we know enough that I feel comfortable in my own life answering for my loved ones and the people I, I care about in the, like, on planet Earth. I feel good working in nuclear and finding ways to do more nuclear energy and trusting that we will use that energy cleanly and well. Yeah, I get, I get that. Um, but I suppose that if the argument is there will be more because we will find it, that is, that doesn't sound particularly, I mean, I, and I suppose the uranium thing, I hear you about the sea from what I understand, there's loads of lithium in the, in the sea as well. Um, but the oil, like, cause this is kind of the thing that Simon Michaud is arguing against in his work, which is that typically when we factor in mater the materials input into engineering decisions, essentially it says like the, mar the market will provide, which kind of goes contrary to the fact that there is a limitation of certain materials well, on everything because the earth is on limited size, right? Um, but, but you mentioned uranium and by extension thorium if we're using these advanced mm -hmm. reactors is the most energy dense thing on earth. Mm -hmm. But thorium and uranium are also pretty common on earth. So mm -hmm. that makes a fairly wild situation in terms of of available resources okay okay i'm just um pointing out these things that sound a bit a bit techno optimist if i may um but the yeah i mean i'm glad you're happy with it <laughs> uh, look i'm i'm not sitting here trying to defend the future of oil and gas that's trickier I'm I'm in a very easy, like a pathetically easy position, just saying, yeah, we've got we've got a whole lot of of uranium and thorium and we've got a way to use it 100 times more efficiently if we decide that it's 
scarce or if it is scarce, like we can just, and then like we could power the world for decades off of nothing but our existing waste. Just, we have a lot. Could you send me um, some papers that I can link to in the show notes to sure. back up, like, you know, these some sources for everything that you're saying? That'd be really helpful because I'm sure people... I, I would love to do that. ...will want to know. And, and, and by the way, you look. struggle to see that from, like, uranium producers. They have to balance. They're like, uh, if we tell everybody there's plenty of uranium, then nobody will finance a uranium mine because they'll say we have plenty of uranium. But we only have uranium if we, if we have the uranium. So there's a weird thing from the resource producers themselves. I have my favorite source, which is Nick Turan. He's a PhD nuclear engineer up in Washington who um, works on these advanced reactors that are going to recycle everything. So he's done calculations that are very easy to follow with his own um, sourcing on there. I'm going to send you and have you send people, if you're okay with it, to Nick Turan's website, What is Nuclear? And he has a page saying, how much fuel do we have? And he breaks down the numbers in a very straightforward way. Uh, you know, it's so, um, to be honest, it's so frightening as like, a as a layman. And I will speak generally about like the state of the world here. Um, because everybody has numbers for everything. Everybody's got numbers for the points that they want to prove essentially. And this whole thing of like, all models are yes. wrong, but some are, are helpful. Um, and it's very difficult to know who to trust or what to trust. I think that, uh, there's perhaps like a, a, a trend of people uh, a little bit like me who kind of can see the big picture don't understand how to read these numbers uh, because as well everybody it takes years and years of training to become what you do or what Simon does or whatever like it's impossible to do it in all areas but the things that make sense is that you know for example it would make sense to me that nuclear if it is excellent was quashed by certain interests um, that wanted to maintain a certain status quo. It would also make sense to me that on a limited planet, we have like a limited amount of something. It would make sense to me that I don't want to be betting the future on technology that doesn't yet exist, especially as we go into an increasingly unstable decade. So I think these are all of the, I mean, these are all of the thoughts that are washing around my head after this conversation. Well, that then I let, think me, for let everyone me combine else. and say that in my reading of the whole problem to date, the limited resource for nuclear at the moment is young, energetic, talented, experienced construction managers. It's not the fuel. It's not even the opposition from like uh, oil and gas. It's, it's not even capital or money or uh, what we're short on is young people willing to bust their ass managing a construction site who know how to build. I am not among this number. I mm. am a nerd in an office. <laughs> That's nice. Nuclear is lacking construction manager okay mark i think i think that's i think i can't keep you any longer um tell me who would you like to platform well if you're looking for the nuclear nerd story and how to build nuclear and what went wrong to nuclear the smartest the smartest guy that i listen to now is james krellenstein he's on twitter at jb krell he spends more time fighting pro-nuclear allies than he does anti-nuclear folks, but he spends even more time than that trying to figure out how to build nuclear plants again in America. <laughs> so he's got an unbelievably deep, a real encyclopedia knowledge of why we haven't built nuclear well and how we might turn it around. So sorry if that's way pointy, but I really Lovely. like um, James Collinstein. All right, wicked. I'll reach out to him. Mike, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Rachel. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together. 